Welcome to unit four. Today we're going to start a new unit. We're going to start looking at the classical period in history. And if you're a student in my class currently, we're going to start a new note taking routine in which you play this video. And if you see one of these little arrows at the top right of your screen, you pause the video to take notes on the contents of that slide because those notes are from the key points. If you are in a live class with me, you can then post any questions you have in the chat, and then we will go over everything you learned all together. As a reminder, notes need to include a lesson title, the key points summarized in your own words, and that can look different for different people. It can be a colorful outline, it can be a concept map, it can be a drawing, um, as long as the content information's there. And key vocabulary, especially words highlighted in yellow along with their definitions. Like I said, today we are going to be starting the classical period in history, sometimes called classical antiquity, sometimes called the axial age, um, the time in history where it's finally worth making movies about stuff we're learning. If you look on the timeline, it's a very elaborate timeline, you'll see exactly what we'll be studying. Over all the way on the top left in purple is what we learned prior about prehistory when the first humans migrated from Africa and then there was the Neolithic Revolution. And then as soon as writing was invented in or around the year 3500-ish, um, we enter the period of history. History begins with the written record. Right? So we get ancient history, river valley civilizations. And as those early river valley civilizations began to decline, we saw the rise of classical civilizations. We're going to go over what that means in just a second. But first, have a look at like the topics we're going to be covering and see how many of them are familiar to you already. We're going to be looking at the Persian Empire, um, the Han Dynasty in China and its unifying ideology of Confucianism. We're going to be looking at the Roman Republic, which then after Julius Caesar became the Roman Empire and then collapsed and fell. Um, we'll look at the very first democracy in the Greek city-state of Athens. We'll look at the rise of two golden ages in India, um, the first connected with the adoption of Buddhism as an official state ideology, the second reverting back to Hinduism for an official state ideology. We'll look at the golden age of Athens, rationalism, Socrates, great philosophers, um, Alexander the Great, and then almost get to the year zero. The year zero doesn't actually exist, but we'll be done with the BCE before the Christian era part of history and we'll get to enter the time in history where numbers move forward. <laughs> the common era. Um, we'll see the rise of Christianity and then the fall of the Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire, which will end the classical period. Here is what you need to know about the classical period to start off. And here I would ask my current students to pause the video, take notes, restart the video when you're done. The classical period, you can think of it as the world enters the empire state of mind. After river valley civilizations, we get big, big growth in the size and complexity of empires and other civilizations. Not everything we learn about here is going to be an empire, just almost everything will be. In addition to the state structure, just big empires, right? We get the big ideas that continue to define our world. We get the beginnings of what became called Western civilization. That means the civilizations that have origins in European and specifically ancient Greek and ancient Roman civilizations, which emerge in the classical period. Um, some key ideas that came out of those civilizations include democracy, rationalism, Christianity. So the way we govern ourselves, the way we think, and a major world religion. Off to the east, we get the very basics of Eastern civilization in this period too, based in the Han Dynasty in China and the Gupta Empire in India. Some key ideas that came out of this time period, some, not all, include a meritocracy, um, Confucius ideology, Buddhism, 
And again, Hinduism as a state ideology in India, which experiences a golden age at the same time and develops a lot of mathematical concepts that give you headaches in different classes at the moment. We also get origins in the Middle East, which is between the West and the East. Um, and those origins began with the Persian Empire and its legacy, which in addition to setting the cultural stage for the Middle East, gives us the very basic structures of how to make and keep a strong empire. In terms of what you need to be able to find on a map, by the end of the unit, you should be able to locate the Persian Empire in the Middle East, um, modern day Iran mostly now, the Han Dynasty in China, the Gupta, and, uh, the Gupta Empire in India, excuse me, and the Roman Empire, which was based in Italy and then controlled all of the Mediterranean. Let's take a little brief tour through all of these empires that we're going to be learning about, starting with the Persian Empire. Um, I mean, just notice the scale of the place. It was huge, huge, huge. Think about how hard it would be to rule this empire well in a time when modern technology didn't exist. The fastest you could go was horseback. Most people traveled by foot if they traveled at all. Um, Persia, you may have seen from movies like 300, um, they portrayed the king of Persia as not a very historical representation of himself, but still fun to watch. Also the Prince of Persia, fun movie. Not super duper historically accurate, obviously, but fun. Um, next, we'll be looking at the Han Dynasty in China. Um, a good excuse to go watch Mulan, or Mulan, if ever there was one. Um, the Han Dynasty emerged in China. It set really the foundational structures that China has built off of ever since. And um, it was home to Confucian ideology, which continues to influence the East pretty heavily. The basic idea there being respect your elders, obey your superiors, respect your place in the hierarchy, strive for social order. We will then move off to a very different part of the world and look at Greek city-states. Um, Greece was an exception to so many rules because it was in a part of the world that was really mountainous, but also very connected to the sea. It developed not as an empire, but as independent city-states, each with their own government and values that were connected by a common culture. Um, Athens is the city-state that we're going to be looking at most closely, although you guys have probably heard of Sparta if you've seen 300. Um, and in addition to just being unusual for the time period, the Greeks gave us so much of our current culture that it's almost hard to piece it together. The way we tell stories comes from the Greeks. The architects for what makes a hero and what their fatal flaws are come from the Greeks and rationalism, logic, philosophy, um, how to think logically, how to arrive at the truth and draw conclusions based on logic and what you can see on earth, not depending on religious explanations. That too. Also, they invented history in the sense of a secular narrative that talks about cause and effect. So, you know, what caused the war? Well, it wasn't just God willed it. Other things caused the war too. So let's explain that. So those were the Greeks. Greek culture spread through the conquests of one exceptional young man who became king at the age of 19 in a little tiny um, province. I don't want to say province. It might not have been a province, like a little kingdom north of ancient Greek called Macedonia. Um, but he had ambition, Alexander the Great, and so he conquered a great empire very, very fast and then died pretty fast too. But his legacy lived on, um, not just in terms of like cool battle dude, but also he spread Greek culture everywhere he conquered. So all of that rationalism, the philosophy, the language spread to include this giant area, which if you're paying close attention, you'll notice used to be most of the Persian Empire. We will also look at India. India had two golden ages, um, times of prosperity, scientific advancement, peace. Um, the first during the Mauryan Empire, the second during the Gupta Empire. In the Mauryan Empire, Buddhism um, became the official state ideology in India and 
really took hold there before diffusing to Eastern Asia. In the Gupta Empire, Hinduism again became the official state religion, but also um, many, many discoveries in terms of math and science and how the world worked took place, and we'll be looking at all of those. Um, we will also get to look at Rome, fascinating case study for people who are interested in government and politics. Rome began as a democratic republic and then gradually grew and expanded its borders to become an empire. So it went from a representative democracy with a separation of powers to become an unlimited government ruled by an emperor before eventually falling. We will also take a look at how cultural diffusion worked in this time period because that is fascinating. Not only were these empires gigantic and prosperous and interesting in their own right, but they were connected. They talked to each other and they affected each other um, through trade. There was the Silk Road trade networks um, overland across the desert and the Indian Ocean trade network in the Indian Ocean began to take root. And then also we have to look at not just trade in terms of the economy, but diffusion, right? Ideas spread. How did that affect every society? Looking specifically at Christianity and Buddhism in this unit. And this unit will end as the classical period ends with the fall, the dramatic fall of two great empires, the Roman Empire and the Han Dynasty. These two empires existed for a long, long time. They really structured the lives of a lot of people in the classical period, and it was almost unthinkable that one day they wouldn't exist. And yet they both fell, bringing an end to the time period altogether. In the West with Rome, we will see how over time, over expansion, um, internal difficulties, and then finally in dramatic form, barbarian invasions topple the empire. And in the Han Dynasty, we'll see something of a similar story where internal difficulties turn into peasant rebellions, weakening the empire and persistent trouble with who they call barbarians at the border also contributes to the downfall of the Han Dynasty.